What's up guys? Welcome back to the channel. Today, I want to talk about three books that came out for Old Comic Book Day, August the 12th of 2020. So, while that intro is rolling, why don't you go ahead and like and subscribe? The first book I want to talk about that came out on August the 12th is Undone by Blood. This is the final issue in this first part of the, the series, I guess. Um, it is the fifth issue, and it wraps up the story of Ethel, who was on a vacation with her family in a year previous. And they were on vacation in Arizona. Her family was murdered, basically right in front of her in a hotel room. And so the journey of this story so far has been following her trying to figure out who did it and where they're at in this small town in Arizona. This story has paralleled the story of Solomon Eaton, who is a man and said who is a cowboy in the Wild West. His son was kidnapped and his wife left dying. And so he went on a journey to um, to get revenge and take his son back. So in this fifth issue, we're wrapping up that whole storyline. There was a lot of great moments in the first four issues. Issue five didn't let me down at all. I was a little concerned that this particular issue was going to bring about some sort of like magic or religious ideas about how Solomon could be connected to Ethel. And fortunately, this all wraps up with simply these are parallel stories these are two people that are on a mission of revenge and salvation and so i thought it was a really cool way to handle basically what probably would have been maybe two issues of a comic book each instead they made a five issue series that tells those stories in parallel and it did a really good job of showing us um some great characters i mean solomon eaton i really like he was an awesome character and i'm excited to find out at the end of this issue that uh he will be returning in 2021 at the same time i would say the first issue or two i wasn't really into ethel's story that much but probably around issue three her as a character really grabbed me and brought me into the fold and by issue four and five, I was really rooting for her to get her revenge. And I like how it played out in the end because it wasn't so straightforward as she basically shows up, surprises them, and gets her revenge. In this book, she actually has to put up a fight. She is injured. And there are repercussions for her actions. Um, even though she feels... I would say she is justified in what she did. Um, she went back, she basically killed two people. Well, she killed one person, she lost a lot of money. But at the end of the day, she got to confront the murderers. And it, it feels very much like she got her revenge. So I'm excited to see what they do in 2021. It sounds like what they're trying to set up is a series of stories that involve mostly Solomon. Um, but they'll always be paralleled to something that's going on in more or less the current day. Um, Ethel's story does take place in 1970 something, 72, I believe. Um, you know, so it, it's still a different time period, but they paralleled the Wild West with Arizona in the 1970s. And so I think this next, um, it sounds like it'll be another five issue arc. It sounds like it's going to, again, parallel a story of Solomon Eaton with uh, somebody else's tale. Maybe another revenge story. I'm not sure, but I'm really excited to see what they do with that. Undone by Blood is definitely on my radar for when it returns in 2021. Shadow of a Wanted Man was great, and I'm really excited to see where Solomon Eaton goes from here. The next book I want to talk about is Adventure Man number three. I think I've stated before, I was a little late to this one. Um, uh, I really mostly found out about it when the second one came out. So I grabbed the first and second copy, went ahead and read both of those, and I've been not so patiently waiting for the third one at this point because this book is fire. 
Um, and Adventure Man, it delivers on every level. This is Matt Fraction and Terry Dodson. And this is another book that is using kind of parallel stories, but this one does have a little more of a connection. There seems to be, I wouldn't call it magic. I would say uh, like alchemy. Um, there's some potions that they drink in one part of the story. And I get the impression we're about to find out that the same has happened in the present day part of the story as well. So I'm pretty excited to find out more about this because in the first issue, you got a lot of Adventure Man and Adventure Inc. And what they were doing in what appears to me to be something like the 1940s, 1950s, um, nuclear world of tomorrow style world. They were basically superheroes. Um, they, you know, Adventure Man himself was um, basically like a heightened human. He was a little bit stronger, a little bit faster. Um, he had like super senses, I guess. It was really cool stuff. Um, and then he basically loses, you know, Adventure Inc. basically lost a fight with, um, against the Baron and uh, the Baron's daughter, the Baroness. Um, a lot of bad things happen. And at that point, you kind of find out that this is a fictional book that our main character, Claire, has been reading to her son, Tommy. And Tommy is absolutely a fan of Adventure Man and all of the books. And he's almost disappointed that there's not any more stories, that they keep reading the same books over and over again. Basically, this strange woman walks into Claire's bookstore one day and uh, leaves a, a, a basically an Adventure Man book with her. But this book isn't truly an Adventure Man book like the other ones. All the other ones are printed by a different company and they're stories about Adventure Man. This book seems to be information about like if you were running Adventure Inc. the business. And so this gets Claire and Tommy very interested. Claire goes and finds the address where the book says it was published. And she sees this giant beautiful tower in the middle of New York. Um, and so then she basically starts applying a lot of what she knows from reading the Adventure Man stories. And she's able to basically phase through a wall and get into this tower. And then there's a little bit of ambiguity there, but she escapes the, the, the tower and arrives home where her giant family is having dinner. And she comes in the door. She's all beat up. Her clothes are tattered. Her pants and everything are all destroyed and stuff. And so they're very concerned, like, what's going on? So that's where the third book is picking up. So we come into the third issue here, and they're in the emergency room. And um, they want her to get checked out because they're very concerned about her health. She doesn't have her hearing aids. And so they're, like, signing to her, and she's saying, like, I don't need sign language. I can hear just fine. Into the ER bursts uh, one of the cops that she spoke to in uh, issue two named Philly. And Philly has this rookie partner. And so whenever they come into the ER, the rookie partner's on a, a gurney, basically. And the doctors are trying to save him, but, like, he's not responding. He They, they pretty much know he's dead. And all of a sudden, and, and you get the explanation of the story of what happened there. Philly tells the story to Claire that basically a kid they were in the subway um some bugs and flies and stuff came flying down and um knocked a kid into onto the the subway tracks so the rookie without even thinking immediately jumps down to save this kid and pulls him out of the way before the train gets him but the rookie does not have time to get out of the way so that's how we end up in this scenario where philly and this rookie are uh coming into the er and the rookie's fighting for his life Claire suddenly starts having flashbacks to what appears to be Adventure Inc. fighting the Baron. And, but instead of Adventure Man himself in this flashback, it's Claire. And so Claire is having this flashback as if she is Adventure Man. And uh, in this flashback, it, she's able to save somebody by doing a blood transfusion. Um, and taking some of her blood and, uh, you know, basically putting it into somebody else and it saves their life. So suddenly she's jumping onto the, the, on top of the rookie on this gurney and pulling tubes and basically doing a blood transfusion right there while the doctors and everybody are trying to fight her back. But of course she's also stronger now and they're 
pretty much unable to stop her. And so, um, you know, that kind of sets up, I think, where this is headed next. Um, because all of those events sort of play out through the end of the book. So there's, um, you know, she gets done and she saves his life. The doctors have almost basically declared him dead. And after she does this transfusion, they're like, his vitals are good. Like, he's stabilizing. So that's kind of setting up, I think, where the book is headed from here. And we're probably going to see Claire um, take up the mantle of Adventure Man. And I imagine a lot of her siblings, because she has six sisters, um, and they're all adopted from different cultures and different races, so it's a very diverse cast. Um, but I think that's what's going to happen, is we're going to find out she drank one of these potions while she was in the tower or something. And uh, she's going to be able to either give this to her siblings or do a blood transfusion to her siblings um, and able to give them these abilities too. So it sounds like we're about to have a brand new Adventure Inc. in the modern world. There's a lot of interesting things going here, going on here. And I really like the way it's coming together. I'm not usually into the like weirdo connection between different timelines and all that stuff. Um, but Adventure Man does it so well. And I think be, the reason it does it is two reasons, actually. Terry Dodson's art is um, not only is it good... And it shows a lot of expressions and everything. But it has this sense of design where the the stuff with Adventure Man and Adventure Inc. is very like 1950s nuclear world of tomorrow. And then whenever you come into the, the modern day with Claire and her family and everything, there's still a lot of those similar design elements there. But they kind of get pushed, um, you know, into the background, I guess. But it creates a sense of cohesion. Like she, she rides a moped and there's just little bitty design elements about it that make it fit the same design stylings of, um, you know, Adventure Man and Adventure Inc. And so I think it's a really cool connection because that actually works in a lot of ways for me. The other thing is this is a book about, it's titled Adventure Man. We can tell that Adventure Man existed and he's coming back through Claire in some way and all this stuff. But the book itself has such a great spirit of, of adventure just through the writing alone, you know. Um, honestly, Claire, I, I mean, I guess she kind of did like some urban exploring and stuff. But the present day hasn't really seen any adventures for the most part. But it feels like there's been so many adventures already three books in. So I think that's what makes this book work and what I really like about it is just the way that it's connected between the two timelines. And... I think I've read all three books probably at least twice, if not three times each now. And I just keep finding things. I'm really excited to find out more about this book. As you can see when I'm talking about it, I'm already like piecing together more and more about it. So I could ramble forever, but please let me know in the, uh, in the comments if you're reading this series, what you think is going on and uh, what your best guesses are for everything that's happening. The last book I want to talk about is Something is Killing the Children, number nine. And you know what they say, save the best for last. This is easily the best series being published right now. If you know a better book series than Something is Killing the Children right now, please let me know below because I don't think there is one. I absolutely adore this book and number nine is no exception. The way that number nine is written though, I'm going to talk about it a little out of order because there's really only two parts to this story or to this issue. And so I kind of want to get the easier part out of the way first. So when the book opens, Tommy is in the woods behind the school, just like we left off in number eight. He's found the monsters. There's some kids that are going into these woods to find their missing brother. And as they're going in, Tommy comes running out. He tells them to run. They hesitate. One of them gets killed. Now Tommy's stuck with the other one. And they're surrounded by the monsters. At the end of the book, we cut back to that scene. And basically Tommy's trying to figure out how to get them out of there. Because he can see the creatures. The person with him seems to be aware that there are these monsters at this point. Because their sibling is laying there dead. But... I'm not sure that that sibling can even see them. Um, this character who we get a name 
uh, is Brendan. So Brendan tries to run, right? Tommy says, no, don't move. He's trying to figure out what to do. Brendan tries to run and is immediately killed. When that happens, the sheriff was inside the school and he had been notified that there were weird noises. So he's come out back. And when he comes outside as an older person, he, he can't see the monsters. But what he can see is Tommy holding the dead body of this uh, Brendan character. There's another dead body not too far from him. So, of course, he pulls his pistol because he's got a clear-cut case of Tommy being a murderer, you know. So, that's, that's the interesting uh, beginning and end to this book. But now, what I really want to do is talk about the middle because this, this was probably the most character building that, um, especially with Erica, that we've seen in Something is Killing the Children so far. We find ourselves at this point where Number 10 is definitely going to be a climactic moment in this uh, series. And so this number 9 issue was really setting a lot of things up. And that big giant middle, middle chunk there was basically just James and Erica hashing it out and trying to resolve where they're at now. So James was shot in, I believe, issue 7, 6 or 7. So he's been in the hospital because he was shot basically like right in the hip or whatever. So he's been in the hospital. Erica hasn't come to see him yet. She's been dealing with a lot of things that have been going on. She shows up at the hospital and he's really surprised to see her because he did not expect her to even show up or stop by or come by or anything like that, you know. So she shows up and they have this dialogue exchange where, you know, James is saying like, you know, he, he's smart enough. James is a smart kid. He can read between the lines. And so he's very insecure in himself. This whole, this whole series started with him basically trying to impress people in a superficial way because he doesn't have any friends. So James is very insecure. He's very lonely. And when Erica showed up and took him under his wing, under her wing, it gave him a lot of like confidence that he was helping. And she basically has to show up and say like, look, I was basically just using you because I needed to figure out where the monsters were. He's like, yo, we were in that cave and I saw you. You're scared. You don't know what you're doing. Why don't you just leave? If if you don't know how to stop this, then let, let the cops figure it out or whatever. But there's no point in you being here and like messing up everything in this town. And so Erica kind of breaks down at that point, explains her backstory and it's kind of an info dump, which I'm not usually a fan of, but I don't know. It's been built up to so well that this does work for me pretty good. And basically, when she was a kid, she was in a situation very similar to James where a monster came in or whatever and basically ripped her, her friend, her best friend open right in front of her and ate her. Um, ever, nobody in the house could see the monster. It's just destroying stuff. So even as like a very young girl... Erica decided, like, I have to try to do something. So she grabs a butcher knife and she takes this monster down. Um, and she reveals, like, basically she had it, like, half dead. A blonde lady with a mask just like hers shows up and captured the monster and put it in her favorite stuffed animal, which is, like, this little stuffed squid we've seen her talk to a few times. So there's still a lot of questions to be answered there. But now we know why she talks to this squid. And we also know that, and then this lady took her and trained her to be a monster hunter for Hal Slaughter and the Order of St. George. We've known about Hal Slaughter, but I'm kind of interested to what she means by the Order of St. George and how those two things are connected. Because, I mean, I assumed that there was multiple houses but I never would have guessed that there was an Order of St. George. And it makes me wonder if there's other orders. Like, there's so much world building going on right there that just gets hinted at. But um, basically here, Erica explains, like, she was trained to be a monster hunter for house slaughter. And she thought she was basically doing the right thing and becoming the good guy. Except what she realized is that house slaughter is doing more to cover up all of the, ki all of the killings than actually helping stop the monsters. And so that's why she kind of has this rebellious uh, personality is she's sick and tired of the way that they're doing things. And that's why she's in the hospital right now because she needs James to be bait 
so that she can end this once and for all. And she finally breaks down and is completely honest with them and tells them, like, I need your help to save a lot of children and end this forever. But the odds of them coming back with their lives are very low. And so this was a, a very honest moment between the two of them. Erica wears her heart on her sleeve in a lot of ways, but she also has this wall. And she kind of keeps everybody at a certain distance. And this was the first time we've really seen her break down that wall and just open up. And so I think that's a really interesting character change. And like I said, I think it just builds a lot of what's about to happen in the, uh, the final issue of this particular story arc. So I'm really excited for the next issue. I can't wait to find out what exactly is going on and what she's talking about here. But it sounds like we're about to get a really big fight and that James is going to be pivotal in this, uh, this big battle that could finally end monsters forever and save a lot of children. So there it is. That's Something is Killing the Children, Adventure Man number three, and Undone by Blood number five. What did you read last week? What did you read this week? Let me know in the comments below. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Look for me on Instagram and Twitter under newguy, N-U-E-X-G-U-Y. And I'll see you next week.